Thank you, Tina. Please, I know, I think I got it. Definitely get Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm used to doing two-day workshops. I'm going to do this in 20 minutes, and you're going to be sorry. <laughs> I'm going to try and talk briefly about the measurement of heart rate variability and then something about the biofeedback. What am I supposed to do here? Oops. Am I supposed to just push the forward or back buttons? Ah, okay. This one? No? Thank you. Ah. So if you look at that tracing, uh, that's a tracing of interbeat interval, the distance between our waves of the heart uh, over a course of about seven minutes. So I have the back of the pointer. Uh, if you went to the general public and you said, what does that look like? They'd say, well, that's a nice looking heart rate, right? Nice and steady as a, as a metronome. Uh, but of course, probably most of the people in this room know that that's not a great looking heart rate. I hear, and I think this is true, that this is the heart rate of a New York real estate magnate. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> because this person has very little affect regulation, poor impulse control and is in very ill health. Uh, it's actually uh, a tracing of a post-traumatic stress veteran, a 38-year-old veteran who saw some horrible things and experienced some horrible things in, in uh, Afghanistan and does have terrible impulse control and poor affect regulation. So I think most of us in the room know that we don't want heart rates to look like that, uh, but really good-looking heart rates look really messy. They should be quite complex. They should drift all over the place, and the complexity of the heart rate indicates the flexibility of the autonomic nervous system to adjust to both internal and external milieu. By the way, it's important to note that blood pressure, this isn't true for blood pressure, blood pressure is supposed to be steady. Variable blood pressures are a bit more bad, and one of the reasons we have, whoa, <laughs> disco. One of the reasons we have these kinds of complex heart rates is to keep our blood pressure at rest in a pretty stable basis. Uh, so the way we do this is we take, uh, try to get an R wave or, an, or a pulse and look at the distances between these R waves. You can do this with technology quite easily nowadays and get these interbeat intervals and then those interbeat intervals, I'm gonna do two of these, turn into just a pretty simple a file of interbeat intervals, but when you plot those intervals on a graph, you get a plot that looks like this, that looks like a very nice complex uh, set of, of uh, frequencies. And you can see there's a lot of different frequencies in there. Um, <clears throat> so we can take a look at those, but you don't even have to look at the frequencies. You can just look at um, of that previous file and just do a standard deviation of segments of that and the variability is a nice analog to that. The more variable it is, the higher the standard deviation. And that measure, in fact, has been used all in tens of thousands of citations as a predictor of all kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> uh, Julian Thayer and his colleagues have just done a masterful job of trying to look at this index of heart rate variability and how it relates to a number of frontal structures in the brain. Um, and here you can kind of see this is a meta-analysis of a number and number of MRI studies looking at the relationship between different stimuli, emotional stimuli, motor stimuli, and different very important er frontal areas in the brain, reach even reaching into the limbic system. And if you're interested in this, you should read Julian's work. It's really brilliant and wonderful and uh, incredibly far-reaching. Um, <clears throat> these indices have been associated with, these are a few of the many things High heart variability has been associated with positive outcomes like emotional regulation, trait positivity, well-being, information processing, executive functioning, <clears throat> and I could go on and on. I'm just giving a few. Low heart rate variability is associated with negative outcomes like morbidity and mortality. Heart rate variability is a powerful independent risk factor for mortality, all-cause mortality, and especially for cardiac mortality. Independent means independent of all other lifestyle factors and genetics. 
Um, on, so it's a marker for depression, for anxiety, poor inhibitory circuits, and for aging, unfortunately. I've been watching mine go down for 25 years. Uh, in cardiology, by going into nonlinear measures of this, fancier measures that look at kind of the complexity of the signal, uh, Ari Goldberger has been able to come up with data like this, where a, a kindergartner could tell you the difference between a healthy heart, an atrial fib heart, or a congestive heart failure. To do that, you have to kind of look at a, a multi-scale entropy measure that's quite sophisticated, but once you do that, uh, this will be in every cardiologist's office in, in short time because look at how powerful it is. It's an amazing diagnostic indicator. <clears throat> uh, back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, Jean Fourier came up with another way of looking at this data by breaking it down into its component frequency components. Uh, when we were all young, the main reason this was good because it put it on stereos and we could listen to Stairway to Heaven in certain states and it sounded really good. Uh, but <coughs> it does have a lot of other reasons for being important and certainly it's how we look at EEG and now we've been able to use it for HRV as you can see. So the frequency characteristics of, of this signal, which are really hard to see by eye, can be done in a, oops, sorry can be done in a Fourier transform, and we get these numbers that represent different aspects of the autonomic nervous system. Probably the most powerful part of this is we can look at the part of the autonomic nervous system that's controlled by the vagus nerve the, of the parasympathetic nervous system, 10th cranial nerve, vagus nerve. And we can get a pretty darn good measure of something called vagal tone. And vagal tone is really sort of a very powerful part of index of a number of the things that Julian was talking about in that earlier slide. So we can use fairly simple tools to be able to get that and get all kinds of information about different aspects of the autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> the main source of variability is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. <clears throat> it's a reflex from the brainstem to the heart. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. It's a braking system. The vagus is a brake on the heart, and when you breathe in, the brake goes off. When you breathe out, the brake goes on. I actually put some animations in here. We can see that. So when you breathe in, that takes that brake off, so therefore your heart speeds up. That's breathing in. And when you breathe out, the, the brake goes back on, the vagus goes back on, and if you see the little pattern in the other side of the slide, you can see what happens to heart rate during those different patterns. So it makes a lot of sense because you wouldn't want to have faster heart rate when there's no oxygen present when you're breathing out. And when you're breathing in, you've got lots of oxygen present, so you might as well get the heart speeded up during that period. It actually saves an estimated 350 million heartbeats in a lifetime. And most of us have a finite number of heartbeats, so it's nice to save a few of them, right? Uh, so then you can look at these things in the, in the uh, Fourier and, and look at the contribution of those two things in the frequency analysis. Another source of variability that's contributing to the complexity is blood pressure. Blood pressure has its own endogenous signal in the body. This is actually an indwelling pressure sensor in an artery. Probably some medical student was forced into doing this. And you can see that there is, in fact, an endogenous rhythm, something or about six per minute. Uh, some people think it might be related to the, uh, our ancient ancestors that came out of the sea where the waves were about six per minute. Uh, but blood pressure kind of goes up and down at about six times per minute. And we have these very cool little sensors in our aortic arch and in our uh, carotid that pick up that tr pressure change. And when, heart rate, when blood pressure goes up, our heart rate goes down. And when blood pressure goes down, our heart rate goes up. So there's another rhythm in that complex signal that's coming from blood pressure and it's about six per minute or 0.1 hertz, somewhere around that period. So, and that's contributing to the complexity and there's a few other slower rhythms that are contributing as well, which I won't talk about now. So if you put those together, you can look at the implications for transformative technology is this is a powerful measure of a really important part of our autonomic, or, or part of our physiology, our autonomic nervous system, which can be really used well to kind of trace different kinds of um, frontal functions, which I think almost all of us are really interested in here. 
And so the measurement of heart rate variability has become incredibly powerful and incredibly frequently used. Um, then we went on to something that's a little different, a, a brand new idea that's 2,500 years old. Um, <coughs> we, it really came about because one of our colleagues in Russia noticed one of the cosmonauts having very strange looking heart rates about 20 minutes a day when he was up in space. And Evgeny Vashilo is this guy's name. He's a brilliant physiologist. And he thought the guy was dying and the cosmonaut was dying. So he called up to him, you know, Yuri, what's going on? He said, leave me alone, I'm meditating. And so Evgeny, who was the last person in the world that would ever meditate, if you know him, <laughs> um, said, whoa, what's going on? Because he was seeing very strange patterns in the heart rate. And he took it to heart and realized he was also a, a physicist, uh, a physical engineer, that what was going on was resonance. Here you can see it in action in a couple of slides. When the, this person is breathing kind of normally here, and then we ask them to go into slow, effortless breaths. And all of a sudden you can start to see, this is, this is beat by beat heart rate, that the heart rates are going from what, 50 something up to 90 something in each breath cycle. And if you look at the frequencies then, all the frequencies get into this one band called the low frequency band. This band is usually considered not healthy at rest. One time we sent a yogi into a cardiologist's office and they told him he was going to die in five minutes because he breathed like this and they saw this pattern, but they didn't realize he was breathing slowly. So, and it turns out that this technique, which has been around for thousands of years, is quite beneficial because it strengthens the barrel reflex, it strengthens a number of reflexes in the cardiovascular system. And here you can see the, the evidence for that in a Quinn Eckberg slide where he was showing what happens in residence. These were medical students were taught to breathe um, at a, with the same tidal volume. Uh, they kept their heart rates about the same through the thing, but these are at different breathing paces from 24 down to six. Well, and they were able to do it and they got peaks at every one of those paces, but look what happens when they get close to six per minute. And that's because they're hitting the resonance between the baroreceptors and the breathing, uh, the respiratory sinus arrhythmia, the two major rhythms are now in total resonance with one another. And just like a swing going in two directions, you're getting these giant peaks and valleys, which looks like it might not be good for you, but just like all exercise, you kind of take it to its extremes and it gets stronger after that. So now we've been able to see very strong changes in heart rate variability over time. So for the last 20 some years, Paul Lehrer and myself and the heart math people have been doing study after study, trying to see what this stuff's good for. And it seems to be good for just about everything that makes us look very nervous. Uh, but we have controlled studies in asthma, functional abdominal pain, fibromyalgia, uh, cardiac rehab, hypertension, and many other areas that you can see there. We've also noticed, and we haven't gotten very many good studies, that people who do this seem to have an easier time shifting to a mindful mindset. <clears throat> I get a lot of Qualcomm engineers in my practice and mindfulness is not something they know anything about or want to know anything about, but they like this technical stuff that I do in biofeedback. So we do the biofeedback first and afterwards I start suggesting a few mindful ideas and they say, oh, I kind of get that. Um, then we start thinking, well, gee, we're getting some effects from these things that we wouldn't expect just from cardiovascular um, circuits being strengthened. And as a uh, I think Roland puts a slide together here somewhere. Um, pointed out, the, the heart math people pointed out to us a long time ago, there's a lot of afferent pathways involved here from the vagus, and they go pretty much everywhere in the brain. So we got very interested in that idea. And <clears throat> also, it corresponds with the work of Helen Mayberg at an electrical stim of the brain at Emory, and a big, big area of work in electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve. So a lot of people are doing that without having any idea why it works. They've just been stimulating that vagal afferent and getting all kinds of interesting results. Um, that's the area that we think is the terminus of that vagal afferent. And it's the same area that Helen puts her electrodes in for the psychotically depressed patients. So all this work on electrical stim, which is not something we're particularly interested in, but it does lead us to think that we might be able to do the same thing in a non-invasive way. 
So lately what we've been trying to do is study what happens during this slow breathing in terms of cortical response. And we found a bunch of research in Germany called heart period evoked potential. Uh, it turned out to be very interesting stuff that no one's really picked up on for a long time. The major guy retired, we couldn't find him to talk to him, we finally found a disciple. Turns out if you don't filter out heart rate out of EEG, in a, in a short snippet of EEG and invoke potential, you get a giant wave from the R wave bombarding the brain. But there's another wave that occurs about 250 milliseconds later, and it's a negativity wave. And this wave corresponds to the ability of people have to predict their own physiology, especially heart rate. People who are good at telling you what their heart rate is without any measurements have a bigger one of these than those that don't. So we, we, began, we began to look at what happens if you then have people breathe at a resonance frequency. And this was just a one trial resonance frequency that uh, Star McKinnon did. And you can't see it so much there, but you'll see in the next slide that we got really dramatic results. This is one we did with Roland and HeartMath too. Uh, and you can see the resonance frequency produced the biggest N250. We think that means that we are stimulating that vagal afferent nerve into the very areas that the, the stimulation works at. Probably explains why we get such good results with depression and anxiety when we do this biofeedback technique. Then we kind of uh, did a longer term study. This is uh, Christina Wang's study <coughs> where we looked at, we compared a group of people who did um, forehead EMG biofeedback and relaxation compared to um, <coughs> HRV biofeedback over a course of five sessions in four weeks. And the first thing we found is something we find again and again, relaxation does not change HRV. So this is one of the indices of HRV. They could, we could put many of them up there. Uh, and HRV biofeedback over the course. And this is resting heart rate variability. So this is a resting sample of their heart rate variability. So over the course of five weeks, these people have actually improved their cardiovascular reflexes by that much and relaxation, which works well and does some good stuff, had no effect on it at all. Then we look at that N250, and you can see this group had a big boost in N250. And we're now looking to see whether that corresponds to reductions in depression and anxiety and clinical populations. So the implications for that, for this group, I think, appears that there's a substantial effect of strengthening autonomic reflexes uh, and frontal inhibitory regulatory circuits from this kind of biofeedback. Uh, but we should probably extend it to almost any technique that uses slow breathing. And for all of you guys, we should really be thinking about any meditative technique that uses slow breathing, whether that's really important or not, is that an important component to it? Um, so uh, we've, we've kind of gone and looked at some mindfulness meditators who don't breathe slowly, actually, and we see them getting much less effective uh, results than the very experienced ones who are just naturally gone down to very slow breathing rates. So we secretly tell our patients during Shavasana yoga that don't tell the instructor, but breathe at six per minute when you're doing Shavasana. You're not supposed to pace your breathing during Shavasana, right? But we tell them, don't tell them, just do it. And they say, oh yeah, I really felt good when after I did that. So, so um, as my students gave me that t-shirt, uh, don't ruminate, resonate, which is <laughs> what the talk is today. So thank you very much. <laughs>